live. You're hey everybody, Chef AJ here live from the house of Heather Goodwin who's lost over 200 pounds on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. I'm also with Shada who's lost over 100 pounds and my mentor and hero, Dr. Alan Goldhammer of mm -hmm. True North Health, the founder. Yay! Let's hear from Dr. Goldhammer. Without Dr. Goldhammer, I would not have lost the 50 pounds and created the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. If you're not familiar with his work, please go to the website healthpromoting.com. Read the book, The Pleasure Trap written by him and Dr. Doug Lyle. Best book you'll ever read. If you're not familiar with True North, I'll just tell you a little bit about it because I really hope you'll go there. It goes like this. True North is where I'd rather be. S-O-S free is the life for me. Every meal all we eat is green. Where the hell will I get my dopamine? Bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba Gold hammer is the doc to see. If you want to live addiction free, he will tell you not to eat that crap. Before you know it, you're out of the pleasure trap. Bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba no food. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba bad mood. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba the fast ba -dum, ba -dum, ba won't last. Food was my life. Goodbye to the strife. True North, we are there. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. All right. Woo! So ladies and gentlemen, we have here people from the Ultimate Weight Loss Program and people from Heather's private YouTube group, The Butterfly Effect Extreme Vegan Weight Loss. And in this room, we have lost a total of 1,310 pounds. Woo! We've got skinny bitches to be, and uh, if you have any questions, if you're watching online, for Dr. Ellen Goldhammer, for Heather, for Shader, and myself, we're going to take priority with the people here. Uh, it's very rare to have an appearance by somebody of Dr. Goldhammer's magnitude, so if anybody has a question for him, me, or the girls, please ask up. Don't be shy now. I'll start. Of course. Yes, so I am down 30 pounds. Yay! Yay! That last 20. Ah. <laughs> I thought when I lost the 30, I'd be okay, but I can see that I'm still carrying weight. Yeah. It actually gets harder. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> the, re the reality is the closer you get to your optimum weight, the more concerned your body is at trying to conserve those last few resources. So when spring comes late, you'll be okay. Um, the reality is that as you, you've been successful at losing a lot of weight, you want to continue to lose weight. It means you have to continue to keep the screws really tight in terms of what you put in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So that means eating large quantities of low-density foods, smaller quantities of high-density food, and, and also looking at the other issues. Are you getting enough sleep? Mm -hmm. Are you exercising appropriately? Mm -hmm. Are you managing your stress? And if you do all the things right, you'll continue to lose weight, but you may lose at a somewhat lower rate than you might have in the beginning when you've had substantially higher rates of weight to lose. Thank you. She's a nurse, and they're always bringing crap at the hospital. I don't eat it. But, it, but it's still, it's not yeah. nice. I treat some nurses, they get hurt lifting those 10 pound boxes to seize candy around. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nurses have it tough though. They're in a very high stress, more so now than, they're, than in the past too. Mm -hmm. Higher patient loads, uh, higher critical care component in the patient loads. They don't get the breaks that they should be getting. They don't, you know, it's very stressful. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, nurses have a disproportionate <clears throat> time oftentimes. Uh, with food, and you know, when they do get a few minutes to eat, typically they're going to go for concentrated, mm -hmm. highly processed foods. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of reasons why nurses have a particularly difficult time maintaining weight. But mm -hmm. I don't care; it doesn't matter. You still got to do it. Mm. <laughs> no excuses. Don't you love that? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Gosh, um, I had a question about uh, water fast. I, I understand during water fast you don't eat anything, just drink water, right? Right. So how does your body deal without having vitamins and minerals and that? Yeah, that's a really good question. It turns out that you don't get deficiencies during water okay. fasting because of the recycling capacities of the body. Fasting okay. itself is a biological adaptation. It's one of those things, if it wasn't for our ability as humans to fast, our species couldn't have survived. Mm -hmm. We certainly could never have wandered away from the tropics. You think about chimpanzees, which can't fast. Mm -hmm. They have to be have a constant source of readily available food. Humans wandered away all over the planet, and when spring came late, if it wasn't for this ability to fast and change our brain, our main burner of glucose, mm -hmm. to burning fat instead, we wouldn't have made it. Mm -hmm. So this is a very natural process, and part of the process is recycling the vitamins, the minerals, the other nutrients that are utilized. That's why you'd actually live longer on water only than you would say on white bread only. Because oh, okay. you would develop nutrient deficiencies eventually on refined carbohydrates or something. You, you typically won't do that within the type of 
timelines that we're talking about with fasting up to 40 days. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Can I ask about intermittent fasting? Absolutely. Yeah, intermittent fasting is an interesting process because it's not actually fasting, it's really more like intermittent feeding, but the idea is to narrow the feeding window. <laughs> and what the studies suggest is it doesn't matter what kind of diet you're even talking about, any diet, that you narrow the feeding window will tend to reduce the proportional calories of that diet. So let's say a person decides they're not going to eat anything, say, before 9 or 10 in the morning, and they won't eat anything after, say, 6 at night. You've increased the fasting period between dinner and breakfast, and by narrowing the feeding window, you improve satiety response, and you tend to eat less. Mm -hmm. And so that's a useful tool for people that are trying to lose weight. Like, let's say, for example, you're eating an exclusively plant food, SOS-free diet, but you're still not losing the two pounds a week you're, that your target might be if you're a female. Um, one thing you could do is keep the same diet, but just narrow the feeding window. Some people will add to that. They'll limit their calories to 600 calories one day a week, or maybe even two days a week, where they eat just raw fruit and salad. And so, you know, if you eat two pounds of salad and a, and a pound of fruit, you're getting about five, 600 calories. So by doing that one day a week, maybe the day that they can rest, that they're not working as a nurse, um, that will also uh, facilitate additional uh, rapidity with which the weight is going to come off. The other thing you can do, if you really want to get radical, is make sure you get enough sleep and exercise. Because mm -hmm. you know, if you're if you're active, if you're walking, hiking, biking, swimming, if you're doing things preferably that you enjoy, mm -hmm. that not only burns extra calories, but it has a blunting effect on the satiety mechanism. So you tend to be a little bit more satisfied. So. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Goldheimer, this is from Facebook. Billy Reed is asking, um, do you recommend anything special for people who have no gallbladder? Yeah. Well, of course. Go Cholecystectomy is a common procedure nowadays because people eat diets that are high in fat and highly processed animal foods. And so they end up getting gallstones and eventually have their gallbladders cut out. The problem is the gallbladder is the holding sac for bile acids. And bile acids are what you use to myceliate fat, to break down the fat. So without the gallbladder, bile squirts directly into the duodenum. So even though you may not be having the pain associated with gallstones, you're actually even more vulnerable, have more difficulty regulating and dealing with fat digestion. So it's even more important to be on a healthy, plant-based, SOS-free diet if you don't have all your organs than even if you do. So it doesn't change the nature of the diet, except that some people um, are, are so sensitive they may not even handle some of the higher fat vegetable foods well. And so then they may have to modify the diet a little bit uh, to accommodate that problem. Which, di which higher fat vegetable foods? The higher fat vegetable foods and things like coconut, avocado, nuts, sometimes the capacity to digest any concentrated fat may be limited. Okay. And so you have to work the diet around to meet the individual needs of the person and, and what they've got left uh, constitutionally. Oh, cool. Can I ask a question sure. about cancer? I have heard, and I don't know if this is true, that cancer needs glucose to live on and it can't live on the ketone bodies that are that we live on when we're when we're in a fasted state, that we move over to like burning ketones and burning fat. Is that true? Okay. Well, first of all, cancer is a broad term and it represents all kinds of different uh, conditions and variation. And the idea that uh, high sugar diets may be um, health compromising and promote an environment that would more strongly favor cancer is certainly popular. I don't know how valid it is or how well validated it is, but. Um, and the idea that fasting creates an environment, the, I think that the evidence suggests that cancer in general cells have higher metabolic needs. And that was the theory behind the use of radiation, that, that, that cancer cells are more vulnerable to radiation than, than healthy cells are. The problem is if you give enough radiation to kill each and every cancer cell, which you kind of need to do or it tends to come back, you also kill the host. And that tends to be rather inconvenient because they say, like, cure the cancer, but I killed the patient. Not such a good thing. So, what the, what's, what's been, they've been trying to do is come up with drugs that are very specific, that selectively go after the cancer, but don't damage the host cells. In 2015, Walter Longo at USC did some experiments with rats. He took uh, 30 rats with cancer and gave enough chemotherapy to kill all the cancer cells, but all the rats died. And he took the same rats with the same cancer, but he fasted the rats. 
and all 30 rats survive. And according to him in his article in Journal Metabolism, uh, fasting represents a way to dramatically enhance cancer uh, free survival, at least in rats. Now they're starting to do it in people as well, trying to augment. The idea is there's something called differential stress resistance and differential stress sensitization. It basically means that cancer cells are more vulnerable in a stressed environment like fasting environment than healthy cells are. Because remember, fasting is a biological adaptation. And that healthy cells are actually protected against toxic irritation in the fasting state. And so the combination of that uh, has resulted in pharmaceutical companies gaining some interest. And they're funding some research to look at if they can come up with a drug that would do the same thing that fasting does, they could call it a fasting mimic drug and make, make lots of money selling people a way to do what happens in fasting, but without actually having to do the fasting part. <laughs> fasting can be uncomfortable or whatever. So um, I don't know if that has anything to do with the question, but that was the answer I had ready to go. So. <laughs> Today, if, if by any chance, if any of you uh, watching on Facebook Live are in the Portland area, Dr. Goldhammer will be speaking tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Portland Veg Fest, I'll be speaking at two. We'll both be in the kale room upstairs. One of the girls in my lecture today on calorie density had a broken jaw, and it, I guess it's it's going to be a while, and she can only eat blended foods right now. And I was talking about how liquid calories are less favorable than weight loss. Eat the salad, not the smoothie. And so she needs to lose a little weight. So if somebody can only eat blended foods, how could they follow the principles of calorie density and still get enough nutrition but yet lower the calorie well, density? Well, make sure that the, blend, that the smoothies that they're using are predominantly vegetable-based and you know not just right. fruit. But like things like mashed potatoes, I'm guessing, are probably something a person with a broken jaw could eat, right? I mean, because she, she, it's not wired, but yeah. yeah. No, I imagine they could, although... Um, if we go back to the to the smoothie concept, a lot of people like juices because they're sweet. You rip apart the cell, you get to the components, so they'll drink juices. A lot of people like smoothies because they rip apart the cells, you get sweeter. And it may be useful for people that can't tolerate um, the natural taste of whole fruits and vegetables initially because they're addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine in their brain from the pleasure trap to try transitionally using some of these things. But remember, the more you process that food down, the more difficult it is for your satiety mechanisms to regulate intake. Think about it. If you just eat oranges till you're full, you don't want any more. You might eat two or three two or three. four oranges. Yeah. But a glass of orange juice will have six oranges in right. it. Right. And so it's going to be obviously much easier to overconsume if you highly processed foods. Now, a person that has a restriction in how much they can chew, you might actually benefit from having a little higher caloric density just so that they can get enough calories in and get enough of the materials in. But it doesn't change the basic thing. You eat the same food no matter how you process it. Well, how does the uh, the blending, I, 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 every time I hear him talk, I hear something new. I understood that it was more calorically dense, these blended foods, but how does it muck up your satiety well, mechanisms? One, one of the reasons is when you introduce large amounts of sugar and you get a big impact on sugar and insulin. Like from a smoothie. Like from a smoothie or from a juice. You sort of just the change, the rapidity with the change, you don't have the the natural buffering effect of the fiber. Mm. And so um, sometimes what we do actually with people with fruit is if you want to have less problems with fruit, just eat a lot of greens with it. It tends to slow down the rate with which the sugar comes. You don't get this big bang. Mm -hmm. You don't get the cravings that sometimes go along with it. Plus, if you eat enough greens, there's not as much room left to overeat on the other stuff. I mean, that's kind of the secret to this whole diet is eat so much low-density food that there's just not much right. room to overeat on. Right. And you feel full. You feel satisfied. Um, and you don't have, you're not constantly having to fight your own internal biology because you've gotten enough to eat. And of course, you get the nutrient density because you get all the vitamins and minerals and right. fiber and protein and everything else you need. Do you think that people vary in their sensitivity of their stretch receptors? It just seems, no, sure. because you see, you've met my husband, he's very thin, and it's like, you know, if he eats like one nut more, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so full, and I can eat like 10 pounds, and it's like, <laughs> is there more? And it's not just the stretch receptors, it's probably the whole mechanism. Some people, you know, like Dr. Lyle. Right. You know, he's the person that you could have, you could give him a piece of something and he would have had half of it. Yeah. You know, you and I are not leaving half of anything, so, you know what I mean? Right, that's but, right. And, or yeah, well, is, our ancestors if, survived. If, <laughs> not his. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know. My that, ancestors it, ate everybody else's ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you think about it, the vast majority of humans ever born on the planet never lived to reproduce. They, they were the losers. They are not your ancestors. We're the winners. You're the winners. <laughs> your ancestors were, were not necessarily the ones that said, oh, you first. <laughs> you, no, they, you know. Yeah. 
And so it, there's a certain advantage that, you know, if you're a person that gains weight easily, you may think, oh, I'm damaged goods. No, you're the person with good plumbing, good absorption, highly efficient systems. The problem is you live in a world where there's all this highly processed food. If you were living in a natural setting, you'd be just like your ancestors, the survivors. You're the ones that would make it. Mm. The problem is in this world, you have to work twice as hard. You have to, plus if you're a female and you have estrogen, the fat storage hormone, and especially if you're pre- or post-menopausal and your oh, metabolic right. rate is thin, you're slowing, <laughs> you have to work really hard. You know, that's, if you think about men and women, men lose an average of three pounds a week on this diet. Women lose two pounds a week. That's 50% difference, and it's not because men are more disciplined. <laughs> Believe me, okay? It's because they have testosterone. If you inject women with testosterone, they'd also lose their fat. And then they get hairy and get cancer and die. <laughs> Not a good strategy. If you inject men with estrogen, we get fat. We grow breasts, we get hips. You get sensitive. You know, we get sensitive. <laughs> Maybe you need a little estrogen, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a question? Do you, yeah, do you have um, recommendations about what kind of screenings people, people should have? I mean, yeah. I, I talked to some people today about mammograms and, and you know, all of that, well, the, as well as the other kinds of Yeah, the of principle in mammograms, the idea that you could radiate people and detect cancer early and therefore save lives, was a great idea. It just didn't work. And one of the reasons it doesn't work is, first of all, breast cancer is a systemic illness. It's not just a local illness. And by the time it's detectable, even by mammogram, you've probably had the disease for as long as 10 years. And so the idea that seeding that's going to take place may already have taken place. So this idea that the early detection, therefore early treatment, would have been great if the treatment was actually an effective condition for the, for the disease. How about the thermal? If there was somebody there doing thermal imaging? Well, there's thermography, which is a less invasive way of trying to detect changes. Um, there's also things now like the ENX2 marker, the Oncoblot, where if a yeah. person has an early breast, they can do a blood test with 99% sensitivity to determine whether there's malignant cells. We're actually doing some research right now with the people from the Buck Institute and, and Luigi Fun or and um, uh, Luigi Fontana, uh, that's going to be looking at whether or not uh, Oncobot positive patients can convert to onco negative with fasting and diet and lifestyle change. So, you know, there's lots of things coming down in terms of better detection. But the bottom line is, it's the treatment that we're arguing about. Right. Is if chemotherapy right. or radiation was effective, then early detection might be highly beneficial. But because of the limitations of treatment, uh, radiating a person, particularly frequently and particularly at yeah, early age, insane. which actually increases the risk of exactly. problems may not be the very best thing. So the idea of thermography is you can get mm -hmm. some heat changes associated with cancer cells earlier, but it's still, you're still limited by the treatment. What I suggest people do is assume you have breast cancer and live accordingly. Exactly. You know, okay. what would you do if you knew <laughs> this was coming? Agreed. What would you do with diet? What would you do with exercise? What would you do with lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, changes? And try to do that mm -hmm. now instead of waiting until you have problems that are you know, much more difficult to manage. I have a question about an extension of the thermography, do you know if it would be equally as accurate to look at the thyroid for cancer, or is it a different type of Well, they thing? have other imaging for uh, thyroid in terms of uh, ultrasound and other uh, procedures. They have MRI now, too, which is free mm. of radiation, and that, you know, that may have biological advantages, too, although I'm not mm -hmm. the uh, expert in diagnostic yeah. imaging. You can talk to some of the doctors yeah. on our staff, which are men are equipped to add about what's the latest and greatest way to do the imaging. M my problem is I'm really focused on health promotion, which is diet, sleep, exercise, and fasting. Yeah. That's the right. basis of health, diet, sleep, exercise, and fasting. Right. If you use diet, sleep, and exercise effectively, use fasting as necessary, hopefully you can avoid having to deal with all the medical management issues, or at least delay and defer, defer yeah. them. Yeah. Right now, yeah. people spend 9.6 years debilitated and eight, 17 to 18 years unhealthy as a consequence of their uh, animal-based, highly processed food diets. You're not going to live forever, but the idea is to reduce the period of debility. And you don't have to spend the last decade or two of your life sitting in some nursing home bed waiting for somebody to change your diaper. You can avoid the strokes and heart attacks by making responsible decisions about your diet and lifestyle today. Eating an exclusively plant food diet free of added sugar, oil, and salt dramatically reduces the likelihood that that's going to come up. It, nothing can prevent everything completely. But that's the very biggest, best thing that you can do right now that'll make a difference. And, and interestingly enough, studies show that people that don't compromise their health, their last two decades can often be their happiest decades of life, mm -hmm. which kind of makes sense. You know, you've done all this work, you finally managed to reach retirement. You don't want to, you know, 
choke the goat at that point, you want to be able to actually <laughs> go forward and, uh, I, that's like, I, I, there's going to be protesters for saying that, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are not in favor of choking goats. <laughs> <laughs> we are all vegan, we love animals. Yeah. Um, I have a question, so they always say get enough sleep. Um, do you have suggestions for yes. how to sleep better? Because, you know, the perimenopausal yep. gals, we sometimes yep. have a little difficulty S with the sleep. Sleep is one of our most important activities. You have to get enough sleep so you can wake spontaneously feeling refreshed. So, you know, that may vary anywhere from six and a half to eight and a half or ten hours, depending on the person, the age, what your stress level is like. Interestingly enough, people that exercise regularly, eat healthfully, and have uh, stress controlled lives tend to need a little bit less sleep, as do people that do meditation and yoga and other things. But you need however much sleep you need in order to be able to wake spontaneously and feeling refreshed. If you're waking and fatigued and need to take a highly addictive nervous system stimulant in the form of caffeine just to be able to function, you didn't get enough sleep. Sleep's one of our most important activities. It's largely when healing takes place. The anabolic cascades associated with healing kicks in during non-REM deep sleep. If you deprive yourself of sleep, you just deprive yourself of healing. Also, I think it's a critical issue for weight loss. I think a lot of people are overweight because they don't sleep enough so they're fatigued. They don't want to exercise, they're fatigued, so they don't want to eat right, they're fatigued, so they eat highly stimulating foods because they're trying to stay up late to take care of everybody else's problems, instead of realizing you have to live your life this way. You have to say, first, I have to get enough sleep, then I have to eat well and exercise. If there's any time left, well, fine, then you can go to work. <laughs> Will you write this a note, doctor? <laughs> so, exactly. off, off of Facebook, um, Susan Chikait has said um, she's with a friend who's pre-diabetic and was told to eat high fiber, or excuse me, high fat, low carb. Well, that's not the recommendations of even the American Diabetes mm -hmm. Association, let alone anybody that's actually thinking uh, about <laughs> health or healing or health promotion. So uh, the diets that work best for, for diabetics are uh, exclusively plant food diets that are free of animal foods, oil, salt, and sugar. Uh, and, of course, controlling exercise and sleep as well. And fortunately, most type 2 diabetics that we see can eventually eliminate the need for medications mm -hmm. and achieve normal glycemic levels, normal hemoglobin A1Cs. Uh, but I you did. have to work harder. Yeah, you, have to work, you have to be willing to work harder at it. Okay. So, okay. Uh, next question is that uh, there, Anna um, Sherper, uh, Sherber it says she has osteoporosis. And could you speak to that? Yeah, osteoporosis is a condition that's a little bit misunderstood. Um, it's a problem of keeping calcium in the bones. That's why taking calcium itself doesn't, is not effective at preventing osteoporosis. Low vitamin D levels can be an issue. People that don't get out in the sun enough to maintain normal 25-dehydroxy vitamin D in their bloodstream because vitamin D is a hormone necessary for absorbing calcium. So um, maintaining, getting normal, checking D levels, making sure they're normal, Reducing high sulfur amino acids like animal-based proteins can also be helpful in reducing the, lo the, the calcium loss that happens as the body has to use calcium to neutralize the toxic effect of the high animal protein diets. And then probably as important as anything is weight-bearing exercise. So actually putting, you know, astronauts that go to space, young, healthy astronauts will become osteoporotic if they don't get resistance training. Now they make the astronauts actually do resistance activities in order to be able to sustain bone loss, because what you don't you use, you lose. Mm -hmm. And so you have to engage in activities that put stress mm -hmm. on the bones, have normal vitamin D levels, and then eat a low protein, high mineral content diet, which is an exclusively plant food, SOS free diet. Also, some things leach calcium from those, like, like the high phosphorus, uh, soda pops, the coffees, the, all these high sugar um, diets that people eat tend to cause a net calcium loss. So there's lots you can do. Uh, the only thing that doesn't help is taking calcium pills. <laughs> are, there, are there better foods to eat? I mean, the plant-based kingdom? Well, greens, the, greens, yeah. greens. If, if anything that, that is called a vegetable is usually going to be really, <laughs> really good. Yeah. Okay. Can you address caffeine? Yeah, it's a highly addictive nervous system stimulant, which is... Uh, which is nasty. It not only contributes to, I mean, think about it. Ask anybody with gastric ulcer disease or gastritis about drinking coffee uh, or caffeinated beverages, and it's very irritating. So, we, we, and it's just as irritating people that don't have gastric ulcer disease, it's just not aware of it because they're not quite as sensitive. Um, it a, has a 17 hour half life, which means that even the coffee you drink 
or caffeine you take in the morning is still going to affect the quality of your sleep at night. Um, and it's also one of the most addictive drugs. Uh, maybe that's why Coca-Cola stopped using cocaine and went to caffeine. Uh, the other thing you'll find is that um, it's, it's a painful drug to withdraw from. We have much more trouble with patients withdrawing from caffeine than we do many of the other illegal drugs that people use recreationally. So I don't think there's anything about caffeine uh, that's good. It does make people feel more alert, but any time there's stimulation, there's going to be some compensatory depression later. So people tend to take more and more until eventually they crash and burn. Um, so includes I would, green tea also? I would recommend, absolutely, any food containing caffeine. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, oh, it's natural, you know, but, you know, so is botulism, but we don't serve people cream of botulism <laughs> soup either, you know, it's like. Yeah. I bet I can make that good, though. AJ <laughs> <laughs> could make it I taste yummy. Yeah. Yeah. So I recommend avoiding uh, caffeine. But people don't like that because, you know, 90% of adults... What about decaf coffee? Well, the, the, using the benzene to take out that one particular chemical. Remember, it's not just caffeine and coffee. There's like 2,000 other chemicals, too. Highly acid, nasty substance. And although saying something, well, it's less bad, right? Because it's decaffeinated. Something being less bad doesn't make it good. It that's right. That's the election this year. Bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 well, Cameron, why do you hate fun? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I have lupus, and I heard Dr. I can't remember her Goldner. name. Goldner. Yeah, Dr. Goldner. Goldner, yeah. Yes. I heard her speak uh, earlier today, which is very enlightening, because her story is kind of similar to my story with lupus. She promotes a lot of green mm -hmm. smoothies, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about well, diet and healing. Yeah, whatever way you get your greens in, whether you yeah. juice them, blend them, smoothie them, steam them, eat them raw, you're going to be so far ahead of everybody else, that's going to be great. I personally would advocate whole food as much as possible. Now, there may be circumstances. Let's say a person, in order to get enough sleep, because they got to bed a little late, they slept a little late, they don't have time to maybe sit and do the salad and all the normal stuff. So maybe that day they take their salad, they blenderize it so that they can approximate it a little bit quicker. There may be reason, but as a general rule, the more whole your food is, the less likely you are to get into problems with eating too much or eating more than what is appropriate for you. Um, and the chewing itself, remember, activates some of the mechanisms associated with digestion. So if you take the same amount of salad and just sit and uh, thoughtfully eat that food, chew the food to a liquid, and versus say blend it up and drink it, you're more likely to get better absorption, better digestion, less microbial disturbance from whole food mm -hmm. than from uh, machine processed food. Again, does that mean there's a problem because you had a smoothie? No, it doesn't mean there's a problem. There's people drink smoothies and they eat blenderized food. Some people, for example, don't have good teeth. And so they're not able to chew well. So we will purposely do what we call blended salads or pulverized salads. And, and sometimes we might take some of the salad, blenderize it into like a dressing to make it more palatable and more, you know. And, and so again, I don't want to get so carried with it. Oh my goodness, if you ever put something in a blender, it's the end of the world. Yeah. But as a general, this idea that why do they advocate juice diets and blenderized diets is because it's more palatable, people, because the, it's sweeter, it you know, you can, you can taste the, the sweetness uh, in a more intense fashion. Mm -hmm. And so it may help with compliance. There may be reasons it may be helpful. If it's working, I got no problem with whatever people are doing. Right. Okay, thank you. I'm going to do a twofer off of Facebook. So um, the first one is from Karen Krause. Uh, she says, uh, do you recommend a multivitamin in, um, on this lifestyle of eating? And then the second one is from Sharon McRae. I know oh, her. Hi, oh, we love her. Oh, wait, hi, oh, come Sharon. here, Joe and Steve. Come here, they're from, they're from Baltimore. <laughs> Look. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> In answer to your first question, I okay. absolutely do not recommend taking a multivitamin because there's many uh, nutrients that are in a multivitamin that are actually toxic, more harm than good. Um, you know, including things like iron for males and vitamin A for females. And so the idea is you wouldn't want to take any chemicals other than the ones that you actually need. Now we do advocate vitamin B12 for vegans because vegans are not getting all that B12 naturally from the feces contamination of their animal-based foods, uh, and because we use hygiene, we wash, we peel, because we don't want worms and parasites and other things. We don't get the bacterial contamination that we might have in a natural setting. And the only place B12 comes from is bacteria. So in vegans, taking a 1,000 micrograms a day of methylcobalamin 
will ensure that they don't get vitamin B12 related issues, and that's a good thing. Okay, and then the but we wouldn't want to take a multiple with potentially toxic products, uh, uh, things that'll do more harm than good. Okay, and then the other part of the question was vitamin D3 and DHA. EPA supplementation for someone on the SOS diet. So if people get enough sunshine and they're fortunate to live in an area where you can make vitamin D. She lives in Baltimore. And, She's getting nothing. Yeah. She doesn't even go outside. <laughs> uh, she then lives in I, a hellhole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she needs to move to California. That's right. yeah. or, Portland. Or, Portland. Or, Portland. or Portland. So the idea is to, to get enough know. sun without burning uh, so that you can maintain 25 dehydroxy vitamin D in the normal level. If you don't, though, and you aren't able to or can't, or maybe you live like in Portland where six months a year you can't make vitamin D, so if your levels are low, then supplementing uh, vitamin D may be an acceptable way to bring the levels back to normal. And you would take uh, uh, vitamin D3, uh, they even have vegan D3 now. Um, Pure Encapsulations is the company we work with and they do have a liquid vegan D3. Uh, the regular D comes from lanolin, which has an animal association because it's, well, they don't have to kill the animal, but at least it is associated with the use of animals, so it's objectionable to, to uh, vegans. So the um, supplementation of D, though, it's a fat-soluble vitamin. You don't want to take any more than is necessary to maintain normal levels because it can't accumulate. So what we recommend patients do is once a year when they do their physical exam and lab, include 25-D-hydroxy vitamin D and make sure that the levels are staying in normal levels, and then you can adjust up or down the dosing based on you know making sure that you're in those target ranges. As far as DHA, for people that maybe they have issues where they can't eat nuts because the X may be like a food trigger for them. If they have one, they got to eat like the whole package, um, and so they're not getting the concentrated sources of fat. Maybe they they're not using those. Then supplementation of DHA might be a necessary uh, consideration for them. For people that are getting walnuts and flax seeds and green vegetables, most of them seem to be able to maintain normal levels of DHA because they're getting enough omega-3 fatty acid, which the body converts to DHA. Um, but there are individual patients that might develop problems. And there's blood tests you can use to measure DHA levels. Mm -hmm. There's other nutrients, iodine, zinc, that theoretically could become a limiting factor because plants don't need those to survive. Most nutrients, the plant has to have enough. So if, if the plant's surviving, you're going to get minimal levels of those nutrients. But zinc, uh, selenium, and iodine, for example, if you lived in Minnesota, where they get that white stuff in the winter. Um, Cocaine? Don't forget. <laughs> no, it's snow. Oh, okay. So it gets like 40 below. I have Sugar? To, so, and you ate all your, soil, all your food from your soil, which would be iodine deficient, you would need to either supplement iodine or include sea vegetables in the diet to get enough iodine, because that soil doesn't have iodine. It's never been covered by ocean. I had a woman at the True North Health Center, which is in Santa Rosa, California. It's a beautiful place. And she was from Minnesota. And she had never left the state, except when she came to us. And she came in fast, and it was like November. It was sunny and beautiful, and it was like, you know, snowing and freezing at home. And she looked around, and she said, you know, that's it. I'm moving to California. <laughs> and she called her husband up, and she said, dear, I've made a decision. We're moving to California. And then she said, no, no, dear, you just pack it up. I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> she said, not one more day. Wow. <laughs> By the way, I want to point out that Sharon McRae, who asked that question, is in Baltimore, so it's 12.30, and she did not listen to you about getting enough sleep. Go to bed. Go to bed, Sharon. Okay, so um, a follow-up to that question was, how about toddlers, and if so, should they take like a chewable or a liquid? Well, I like um, liquid uh, just because I'm cheap, and it's cheaper to get the liquid, and you don't have to pay for encapsulation. Okay. And if you put a drop of the appropriate liquid in the, in the toddler's food, you don't have to worry, deal with swallowing issues or choking okay. issues or anything Okay, else. but for B12? B12, it Two. needs to be supplemented. It, well, it, when, a, when a baby is breastfeeding, assuming mom has normal levels of B12, baby's going to get normal levels of B12 through breast milk. Uh, when, a, when a child is eating food, so after they've been weaned at two or whatever it is, then you would supplement B12. Dr. Goldhammer, do you recommend probiotic foods or probiotic pills or anything like that, or uh, like fermented foods? Um, although fermented foods, if you get foods without salt, you know, if you're, the biggest problem with most fermented foods are high in sodium. They can be made without, mm -hmm. you can make pickles. You, and can, you make, can even buy them now. Yeah, okay. So. 
I don't have a, a problem with them. I'm not convinced that it's a huge <clears throat> necessity or a tremendous clinical benefit. Uh, because if you eat a, an exclusively plant food diet without sugar or salt, you tend to maintain normal gut microbiota. Mm -hmm. Now that's an important consideration because people say, well, it's just a little <clears throat> bit of sugar. And it may not be that much sugar to make you fat. In other words, it may be a small amount of calories, but it can still have an effect on the gut microbiota and the floral balance in your gut. Since 70% of your immune system involves the digestive system, as you'd expect, that's what protects you from the outside in, uh, in the world. Maintaining healthy gut bacteria, it turns out to be really important. Think about bacteria, some of, all of them have waste products. Some of them have waste products that are particularly noxious to us. In fact, that's usually what's associated with a bacteria that's, that's particularly poisonous, is that we don't like their poo. And they're living in you and they're, they're uh, relieving so themselves. Good. <laughs> and so you want to make sure you have the kind of bacteria where you know their poo is food fertilizer instead of poison to you. And wow. as a consequence, uh, small amounts of sugar and other things, particularly in vulnerable people, can disrupt flow amounts and have a bigger effect than what it seems like it ought to have. And then there's also issues of cravings. Some people find as long as they don't have any, they're okay. But as soon yes, as they sir. have any, like the, you know, Dr. Lyle could have a half a piece of chocolate. Put it in the thing, it's and it would so sit there. annoying. I had dinner it, with him, right. and he just doesn't but, even finish the food. On but his some plate. people would have a bite of chocolate, <laughs> and they put the stuff in the cupboard. But they could hear the chocolate oh, yeah. calling yeah. their <laughs> name. Yeah. Eat me, eat me. <laughs> they have to eat just to That's shut it up here. so they can go to sleep. <laughs> some people, in my patients, can hear it calling all the way from Seven yeah. Eleven. We have to get them like special earplugs, you know. And so the point is, if you know that you have vulnerabilities, sometimes it's easier to just not do it. Mm -hmm. than it is to tease mm -hmm. yourself and have to fight with yourself over it. Alcoholics, you don't say to alcoholics, well, just have a little glass of wine. Just have a little bit. You'll be fine. Don't be such a fanatic. You're no fun anymore because they know. They have a little, the next thing they know, they're waking up under the Golden Gate Bridge naked wondering how they got there. Because you know? <laughs> they're not able to control themselves. Can some people have a glass of wine and not become a drunk? Sure. But if you're a drunk, that's not you. Some people can have a little of this, a little of that. They're fine. It doesn't bother them. Other people, mm, not so good. So those things that you know call your name out, maybe those are things best not to bring in the house, not to tease yourself with, and focus on the things that you, know, you don't have. And so for those people, um, it's easier to just say no. Um, I think Dr. Lyle and I sometimes get into a little disagreement with it because he says, what's the problem? You have a yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But, but he doesn't believe in food addiction, I don't think. Do yeah. you? I mean, don't you believe it's well, real? Well, I think, of course, there's, you know, there, there's a huge variation in people's responsiveness to all these variables. And do you, do you not believe in alcoholism because some people can drink and not become a drunk? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's clear that some people have tolerances. For, and it's never carrots. I've never had a person where it's like, oh, I get up at night, I gotta go down to the store and get another bag of carrots. It's always these pleasure trap things. Artificial concentrated calories, it rings your bells. You know, it's, it's not usually whole natural food. And that's part of the empowerment of whole natural foods because you get to eat, you get to be full, you don't have to constantly be, you know, warring with your biology. Uh, you get your nutrient needs met, and yet you can still sustain health promoting weights and you know, all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, when they do studies on B12 and what the optimal level is and what, what the site right. level is, do they take into account uh, seasonal fluctuations? Like, I, I am outside in the summer, you know, late spring, early fall. Are you talking about D or B12? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. D. Uh, D. 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 Yeah. So, well, yes, what happens is you expect in the winter that your levels are going to start dropping in the summer. Uh, with your sun exposure, especially if you can expose your body to the sun, your D levels are going to rise again, and that can carry, because it's fat soluble, it will carry over the year. But the problem is, a lot of people have become so depleted that because they've been behind plate glass, they don't get exposure to sun, they've been told, you know, listen, doc medical doctors say don't smoke, people smoke. They say don't drink, they, they drink. They say don't eat too much, whatever that is, animal foods. But they eat that. They say, don't go out in the sun. They say, okay, fine, that's the one thing I'll buy. No more sun. And they cover over it. And it makes sense. You don't want to burn and increase your risk for skin, uh, 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 skin cancer. But there's no evidence that health, healthful exposure to sun does anything but actually reduce risk of all problems. So that may be another one of the examples where medicine didn't quite get it exactly right. So How when you're testing, should, yeah, should you be testing in the middle of winter or, I mean, because if I test in the middle of summer, it might be really high. And, yeah, and so what, if, if your levels are high in the summer, 
depending on how hot, you can be confident it'll carry through, you know, until next summer. But so I'm more interested, I don't care when we test, we can take into account we're testing either in the beginning of summer or the end of summer, and you take that into account. But if the levels at the end of summer are low, and you're not going to get sun exposure for, uh, that's hot enough to be able to form vitamin D, uh, you know at that point we have to bring the levels up to normal, from my, from my opinion. There's uh, two questions. So the first one is just kind of a follow-up with supplementation, and that was about um, how about uh, probiotic pills? Yeah, for people that have been unfortunate enough to be treated with antibiotics or things that disrupt the gut flora or they're eating greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh, highly sugared diets, they may have serious <laughs> disruption in their gut flora. And it does look like exogenous probiotics may have some beneficial mitigating effect. Um, but the best way to create normal flora is with a normal diet. And, and, and if you can't get it right with diet alone, then we use fasting. And rebooting the hard, if you, you, if you have a corrupted hard drive in a computer and you reboot it, you turn it off, turn it on, a lot of times it clears a lot. That's what it seems like fasting does to the microbiome in the gut. Now we're going to be studying that this next year with the Buck Institute. They'll be doing um, liquefied samples before and after fasting, comparing what happens to the microflora. So we'll have more objective data. Uh, on that. For people that are interested in that, they can go to our website at healthpromoting.com, look at the studies we've already published and the ones that will be coming out. And so I think we'll be able to prove that. So yeah, I think probiotics may have some benefit, but I have to say a lot of the probiotics that are sold are completely ineffective <coughs> because they're, you know, shelf stable, but they, you know, the, the ones that seem like they work the best are a pain because you have to refrigerate them, you have mm -hmm. to ship them refrigerated, they tend to be pricey. And so... I think there's a role, but again, the goal would be to maintain a normal flora by not putting the sugar and the processed floury garbage in the mouth to begin with, and then you don't have the disrupted flora. Okay. And then the uh, next question is kind of off the supplementation. Um, it's from John Foley, and he asks about loose skin um, during rapid weight loss yes. and the autophagy, and does it, um, uh, how does that affect it? And have you noticed any patterns at True North? Slower weight loss, does it equal less loose fat? No, when you lose a lot of fat and you've, and you've had that skin stretch out, it takes a while for the skin to tighten up. And the older you are, the slower it is. So you'll notice in younger people, they tend to kind of bounce back, so to speak, a little bit quicker. And sometimes when there's been extreme weight loss, um, it doesn't completely correct. And sometimes there's even situations where uh, cosmetic surgical treatments are a consideration for people. Uh, but there is a surprising amount of recovery, particularly in people that do really radical things like exercise, <laughs> where they tone, they do muscle toning, and they and it does take time. And you can lose weight faster than your skin can recover, and so you have to keep that in mind. But you know, having um, the excess skin is strictly a cosmetic, not a health threat. So it, it's a it's a concern to people, um, but it's it's there's nothing about that that you know is going to put you in a nursing home bed from a stroke. So we got to kind of keep it all in perspective. And can I just say, say, I I have some loose skin. You know, I, when you take off over two hundred pounds, and I did it in my forties, so that was not optimal timing. You know, like some people, and so I have some loose skin. But you know what? You can hide loose skin. You cannot hide fat. So, um, yeah. it, and and you can always get it taken off if it really bothers you. But I've talked to a lot of people who've taken off a lot of weight and maybe have some loose skin. And I haven't heard one of them say, hey, I'd rather be fat and not have yeah. all this yeah, loose skin. And it yeah. doesn't increase your risk yeah. for diabetes. It doesn't <laughs> cause fatigue and irritability. It doesn't increase your risk for breast cancer. So, you know, the, um, being concerned that you may have some cosmetic consequences isn't justification for compromising your health. Right. Well, John lost um, 150 pounds. Yeah. So yeah. He's, yeah. And, and, yeah. Nice. You know, we've had, we have about 30 people here that, and we've lost 1,310 pounds. And some people are at their goal weight, some people are still struggling and at the plateau, and some people maybe even gained a little bit back. What words of wisdom or inspiration can you give to all of us here live and watching to keep us going on this path that seems to be a road less traveled, that's, that's difficult, and... Uh, you know, what can you say to us to motivate us? Well, to I think this is one of the most difficult things people can do in our society, is to try to adopt a health-promoting diet in a world designed to make you fat, sick, and miserable. And everywhere you go, you, you know, you're looking for support. It's going to be very difficult to get it because most people are going to give you what you want, not what you need. Mm -hmm. So what you want is a way to it's indulge the pleasure trap without paying the price. And what you need is a way to get out of the pleasure trap. Mm -hmm. But because 
everybody you know just about is going to be antagonistic and have very strong almost religious beliefs about how important it is to dine on dead decaying flesh and all the rest of it. Um, you have to be very careful. And Dr. Lyle in The Pleasure Trap talks a lot about strategies, the seam strategy and other things to go along and get along and not piss people off too much. Um, so I don't think I can be very encouraging. I think you have to accept it as an incredibly difficult challenge. What I can say is I've never actually had anybody yet that's paid that price and done that work and said it wasn't worth the trouble. You know, they do say it's worth the trouble, but you know, my mom is 90 sure years is. old, and she adopted this approach 30 years ago. And um, her friends were very antagonistic. Uh, and she said, now all 52 of her lifelong friends are dead. She's the last one surviving. She said, the hard part is there's nobody left to say, I told you so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last, maybe last question, last one or two. Oh, okay, because I was going to say there's still a lot more. Well, then you know what they can do is they can come to True North Health December 23rd to January 2nd for the holiday cooking extravaganza where Dr. Goldhammer will be lecturing along with other great doctors like Dr. Clapper, and I will be doing cooking demos, and Shada will be there, and that's where they can come see us. I heard they, you guys even get dessert. That's right. He lets us twice. He lets us have dessert. Yeah. They twice. can also call me at the True North Health Center and I'll be happy to answer their questions so okay. they can call me. Because we have questions on anemia, on di uh, diverticulosis, um, hair loss, and um, I, well, how about choosing one of those? And well, we can that. answer those quickly okay. enough. Okay. Can I, uh, can, yes. can you address the anemia? I yeah, anemia is, you know, anemia is kind of a, bri a big problem. Generally, when people have anemia, it's because they're leaking. They're leaking blood somewhere. They have menorrhagia with excess menstrual periods. Uh, they have gastric ulcer disease, they're losing blood into their stools. There's, or on the other side, there's a problem, autoimmune related problem or disease problem where they're not producing cells. Or they're not getting enough uh, essential nutrients in their diet. So if they're iron deficient, if their ferritin levels are low, they're not getting enough iron in, that's easily solved. Eating an exclusively plant food diet, generous in greens, uh, that do, and without the, the coffee and the things that tend to leach. Um, nutrients from our body will help correct the intake problem. Um, if the problem is leaking, we have to fix the leaking. If we've got ulcerative colitis or autoimmune disease involved in the gut that's causing bleeding, we need to do fasting and get the diet right to get that condition to come into remission. If the problem is um, excess periods, women oftentimes have elevated estradiol levels and other hormonal changes. Estradiol normally would secrete to estriol or convert to estriol by the intestinal mucosa, the bacteria that live in the gut, rather, and the liver. So if you have a toxic diet and nor abnormal microbiota, you may not be converting your estradiol to estriol and excreting it. Estradiol goes up and you get conditions like fibrocystic breast disease and dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia. So many of these people, by the second cycle after fasting, and even with aggressive diet and lifestyle change, can eliminate the excess bleeding, and then they stop losing more iron than they're able to replenish. In men, it's actually op the opposite. Too much iron is a major problem in terms of cardiovascular disease. So you don't ever want to supplement iron in men, particularly like taking in incidental iron from supplements or other things, because it can be actually associated with increasing the risk of problems. But So the idea is find the source of the leaking, correct the source of the leaking, usually with a healthy diet and lifestyle, and then the anemia problems begin to correct. There are some situations where supplementation may be necessary, but you have to be careful with iron supplementation because it leads to constipation and other side effects. So it's not, it's not just the simplest thing. You just take more iron in. As far as the, uh, what was the other question? Diverticulosis. Diverticulosis is a secondary effect from constipation. So people eat uh, diets that are high in animal foods that don't have any fiber. How much fiber is there in beef? None. None. Zero. Fish. None. Cow. Zero. No fiber in any animal food, only plant foods. And so if you get chronic constipation, you get out poaching, think about what happens with constipation. What do people have to do? They strain. What is associated with that? Diverticulitis, also hemorrhoids and fissures and uterine prolapses and varicose veins. These are all conditions that used to be very rare or very common now because people are eating diets that don't have adequate fiber. And so they have trouble with bowel function. People on plant-based SOS-free diets tend not to have problems with bowel function. Bowel function is one of the things that actually normalizes, sometimes rather quickly, 
you know, I've had people that hadn't had unassisted bowel movements for 20 years. Mm-hmm. You unassisted? Know, you mean like there's a person that actually <laughs> causes Usually they're using <laughs> enemas or other stimulants or other, other things. And as a consequence, the, um, and seeing that corrected, you know, literally within days. Hello, may I help you with your bowel movement? <laughs> I mean, I've heard of assisted suicide, but I've never heard of assisted bowel movements. <laughs> And what was the other question? Hair loss. So any time you go through rapid weight loss, uh, including pregnancy, with not weight loss but hormonal shift, hair follicles, instead of coming out slowly, will mature all at that time. As the body says, oh, we're in a phase of deprivation. Let's not waste a lot of energy anywhere. So the, the hair follicles mature. Then the hair a month later will come out in a higher quantity together. You don't actually lose your hair follicles. It's just the hair cycle is disrupted. The hair grows back. It usually isn't an issue. Now, there's other thing with hair loss, though. You could have thyroid dysfunction, endocrine disorders. So I mean, it's but it's very common that you'll see some thinning a month after, say, any rapid weight loss, including that happens after prolonged fasting. So you just have to realize that no, this is okay, and that it corrects itself. If it's not correcting itself, you want to make sure that your doctor's checking your thyroid function and other issues that might also be associated with that. There's also stress-related alopecia and other problems and disorders that come up. But again, as a general rule, the most common thing we see in healthy people is temporary uh, thinning that's associated with rapid weight loss. On the diverticulitis. Ter- ter- I can't remember the time. Yes, thank you. Is there, once you have it, do you always have it? Or is there a treatment? Does it go away? Well, it's like anything. Can you cure obesity? No, you can only manage it. Can you cure high blood pressure? Yes. No. Yes. No. No. no, you can only manage it. If you go back to the salty, fatty processed mm-hmm. foods, it's coming back. Oh, okay. okay. Oh. So you're not curing cancer, you're not curing obesity, and you're not curing diverticulitis. What you're doing is you're managing it. Okay. Now, can you, if a person goes on an exclusively plant food SOS free diet and normalizes their blood pressure, can they maintain normal blood pressure for the rest of their life? Yes. yes. Absolutely, but they're not cured. As soon as they go back to the diet that caused it, it's coming back. And the same things with obesity. Believe me, there's never been a single person cured of obesity. Not one, ever. If they go back to what caused it, they're getting it back. So it's a constant, lifelong battle of trying to stay out of the pleasure trap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the same with things like autoimmune diseases? Absolutely the same sure. thing. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. Um, i give you an example. A patient with lupus comes in, gets off methotrexate, prednisone, resolves the problem, does fine for six months, eats a single meal at a... At a um, Potluck. Potluck. Oh, no. <laughs> That's vegetarian carrot soup, but had dairy in it. Because oh. vegetarian to that person meant no meat, right? right. One meal flares the condition. Oh, God. Wow. Yeah. Perfect patient. This is a woman who cannot cheat without debilitating pain. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> she has to comply. <laughs> so, I mean, if there was a pill that you could give somebody that would make, you know, it's like Narcon for, you know, it's, so we get excellent compliance because she has no choice. Yeah. And ultimately, when people realize they don't really have as much choice as they might think, then sometimes it almost gets easier. Mm-hmm. Dr. You know? Goldfarber, I have one last question. Um, my nephew, who's rather young, like 20 years old, was diagnosed with uh, Crohn's disease. Yes. Is this something also like diverticulitis? That no. That Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease where it's their immune system attacking their colon. Right. So, diverticulitis. Well, well, what what you have to do with Crohn's disease is recognize that number one, it's a very serious disorder. It's treated with very serious medications, which sometimes create more problems than they solve. Um, So the idea is first stabilize the person and get them off the prednisone and the medications. Second is they have to control what they put in their mouth. And sometimes ulcerative colitis or Crohn's patients have to be even more careful. They definitely have to get off dairy and things like gluten and other triggers that are problems for them. They have to stay away from the sugar and the coffee and the alcohol and all the processed foods. And but sometimes it has to go even further. They may have to be focused on. They may not be able to tolerate raw salad, for example. The raw vegetable materials uh, or even fruit can be a little bit too exciting for the colon in early phases. They may have to do more steam starchy vegetables. Think about how you would feed an infant steamed sweet potatoes, simple foods. So you may have to go to a very simple, mostly cooked, starchy vegetable-based diet. And then slowly, as people heal, you can diversify the diet and and allow them to harvest. It's a very difficult condition. There's often 
significant psychological components that go along with it. Either have that disease makes you kind of have issues or having issues might also make you vulnerable. Because remember, again, the immune system, 70% of the immune system is involved in the, in the intestinal tract. So anything that affects you psychologically can also affect you in the gut. And so, you know, these things all go kind of hand in hand. So it's manageable condition, very difficult condition. The only thing that the medical profession tends to agree on is that diet has nothing to do with it. It's absolutely mm -hmm. nothing okay. you can do to cure it. Learn to live with it and take your drugs and don't ask any questions. If you have recommend it for somebody like that to convince him, you know, to... Well, what I would recommend they do is, number one, go onto our website, complete the registration form so we can review the medical history in detail, call for a free consult at the True North Health Center, and then we'll try to talk to them about what their options are. Um, there's also some books and materials that are available that can help guide a person. But a lot of people, frankly, will say, you know, I'd rather die than have to eat like you do. And they'd rather die than give up smoking. And you know what? They do. And on that note, we'd like to thank you all for watching. <laughs> let's hear it for Dr. Allen. And if you have any further questions, go to the True North website, www.healthpromoting.com. And if you have anything, any health goals, if you want to lose weight, it's very simple. There's only five words you have to know. Do everything Dr. Goldhammer says. Thank you so much and good night. Good night, guys.